Hello and welcome back. My name is Cecilia Peralta. I am a virtual assistant. And in this channel, I share with you tips, tutorials, and industry insights to help virtual assistants to become successful business owners. And in today's video, I wanted to take you on a tour so I can show you more in depth what are the tasks that the transaction coordinators have to complete from the time they receive a contract all the way to closing. So let's jump to my computer. Okay, so here we are on my desktop and we're going to um, review what happened when we open a file, how we review the contract and what are the, what are the uh, most important things that we look for, uh, the due dates that we care um, the most, what is the timeline, contacting the parties and you know, why is that so important and who are the parties, reminders, compliance, and post-closing. All right, so opening the file. To me, that's the most important thing when it comes to the file. And the reason being is that at the very beginning, you're going to spend the most time and you're going to put the most effort and that is going to ensure that you have a smooth transaction. If you don't do the work up front, then you're going to suffer the consequences later. Believe me. So why so important? Once that we receive the executed contract, executed contract means that all the parties um, signed the contract already then we are going to start working. Now, it's important to understand as well, who are we assisting? Um, are we assisting the buyer's agent or the listing agent? And, you know, the tasks vary a little bit from one to the other. So it's important to understand, you know, uh, who is our client, okay? So how do we get all that information? We have a couple of sources. You can receive that contract two different ways. Sometimes if you are uh, offering like an intake form, which I highly recommend, you're going to be asking whoever is hiring you for that particular transaction to complete a series of questions and you're going to be gathering everything that you need from the intake form. You can create that intake form in a um, Google form or maybe you have it through your task management system and you can just offer the form that way. Regardless, that is one way where you can have all the information related to the transaction. Now, if you don't offer um, an intake form to your clients or potential client, then for the most part, what happens is that your client, being the listing agent or the buyer agent, is going to send you most likely by email a copy of the contract. So once that you receive a copy of the contract, you are going to be able to get a ton of information from there, right? <clears throat> the most important is going to be the address, the um, seller and buyer's names, and the other realtor's information, at least the name, and you're going to be able to get the terms on the contract. However, you're not going to be able to have the contact information for your client's client. So if you are really helping the listing agent, you might see the seller's name on the contract, but you're not going to have in the contract the phone number or the email, at least not in the contract that I uh, I'm more familiar with. So before we keep going, let me just say that I work in the state of Florida. I don't work nationwide, at least not right now. And I am super familiar with everything that is related with Florida. However, if you find out that in the state that you work, the information is a little bit different, and there are different things included in the, um, in the contract, please keep that in mind. My experience is here in the state of Florida. All right, with that out of the way, let's continue. So how do we get the information? Again, on the contract, you're going to get some information. If the agent, whoever, buyer, seller's agent, send you the contract and include, for example, the uh, pre-approval letter, for the most part, you're also going to be able to get the lender's information 
from that letter. So my recommendation is that you do your due diligence and you are resourceful and try to get as much information from where what you have as you can. And the things that you are not able to get, then go ahead and contact your client and ask for that information right away. So you don't waste any time. Now, if you are a licensed real estate transaction coordinator, you might, as a realtor, be able to have access to the MLS. So if you are, you might be able to get way more information out of the MLS. So this type of uh, things, if you can figure it out yourself, then there is no reason to be waiting um, for that information from uh, your client. But if you are stuck and you cannot find it, go ahead and ask. So once that you collect all the information, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be reviewing the contract. And I told you that opening the file is the most time consuming because you're going to make sure that everything is accurate you're going to make sure that you're not missing any contact information and you're going to make sure that you're not missing any documentation either. So when you receive the contract, you're going to be looking for three main things. One is signatures. A lot of times people think that they are in the contract and they start counting days and start, you know, doing all these, uh, you know, things that you need to do when you are under contract. However, Sometimes happen that I review the contracts and I'm like, oh, there is a signature that is missing. So technically, you are not actually executed. Okay, so that is super important that you scan, you know, visually scan the whole uh, contract and uh, find out if there are any type of missing signatures because. If so, there is no executed contract. Sometimes it also happen that the original signatures are there, but someone make a modification to the contract and there is no initials on that, then that is not valid. So you need to make sure that all the initials and all the signatures are in place. Now, once that you understand and confirm that everything is good with the signatures, look for accuracy. What do I mean about that? I give you a couple of examples. Sometimes uh, happens that in the contract that we use here in Florida, you have to put a closing date in a format of a date, right? So you're like, okay, I'm closing on December 31st. Okay. And then you have to select for the loan approval an amount of days, being like 30 days, 45 days, 15 days, 40 days, whatever it is that you are put in the contract. So sometimes it happens that when I calculate the dates uh, for the contracts, for the due dates and so, I realize that, for example, the loan approval is after the closing date. So that is, to me, a discrepancy and I don't like that. So I always request them um, to fix it, okay? I facilitate that. So that is an example of accuracy. Another one might be that, for example, the property is on an HOA, a homeowners association, and you can include a rider, meaning an additional document that now is going to become part of the contract, which is a disclosure for the homeowners association. So sometimes that disclosure is actually accompany the uh, contract. However, the contract has a section where you have to check mark the additional addenda that you are included with your contract. That way you know that that is actually part of that contract. Sometimes they include the document, but they never check it off on the, um, on the section for the additional addenda. That is, to me, something that is not accurate. So I always get it corrected. And then what you're going to be looking for is for the terms. What are the terms? Terms are how many days the buyer have to complete the escrow deposit, how many days they do have to complete the inspection for the inspection contingency, who is it going to buy the uh, home warranty, if anyone is going to offer that, uh, who is paying for the owner's policy, uh, what is the closing date, and things like that. So those are the terms, and those are super, super important for you to 
be aware of be, and, and, and put them in your task management system. So I wanted to also give you the uh, timeline of the whole process. So you're going to have different um, milestone during the transaction. The first one, in my experience, is the escrow, the escrow deposit. So <clears throat> for the most part, people put in the contracts like three days to complete the escrow. So what happened if that on the third day, the buyer didn't deposit the escrow? Then we don't have a valid contract, you know, because the buyer cannot default because they didn't complete the escrow. So that is the first milestone. After that, let's say that the escrow was done, then we're going to have the inspection. And during the inspection, obviously the buyer is going to hire a home inspector. The home inspector is going to give a report and the buyer is going to present that report if they have any type of request for repairs to the seller and the seller is going to evaluate and decide if it's something that wants to do or not. So after the inspection, if everyone is in agreement to continue with the transaction, then we are going to have the appraisal. Now, let me mention, it doesn't necessarily have to be done after the inspection. However, for the most part, the buyers would like to first get done with the inspection and with all the negotiations around the inspection because the buyers pay for the appraisal. There is an appraisal fee that is non-refundable. So what happens if they pay for the appraisal prior to the inspection or during the inspection while they don't know yet if the house has an issue or if the seller is in agreement to do these repairs? In some cases, after the inspection, the buyer decide not to move forward with the contract, and that's it. If they paid already for the appraisal, then they kind of lose the money. So in my experience, uh, what I normally see is that the buyers prefer to get done with inspection once that everyone is at the same page and they decide to continue and moving forward, then they order the appraisal. Now, hopefully the appraisal is going to come at value, meaning that it's you know, the appraisal value is going to match the uh, purchase price or is going to be higher. Um, or maybe it didn't, but the buyer is willing to pay the gap, the difference. And hopefully the appraisal didn't call for any type of repairs or conditions. And let's say that everything is perfect. We can move to the next milestone. And I put it um, as number four, the title search. However, the title can be completed, you know, even before the inspection. In my experience, the title search don't take more than a week in most cases. Okay, in most cases. So, uh, but it's not just the title commitment that you're waiting for. You're also going to be waiting for the lien search, which takes a little bit more time than the title commitment, in my experience. So in the title commitment, the title company is going to make sure that the title is um, marketable. Now on the lien search, you're going to receive <clears throat> information for any type of liens that are on the uh, property, um, information on the taxes, if they're being paid or not, and also if there is any type of open or expired permits or code violations. So on the lien search, if it's clean, then it's wonderful. Now, if there is some type of liens on the property, sometimes those liens can be, you know, remedied by getting them paid at the closing. If the lien search brings, for example, a code violation, that might be something that cannot be resolved with money. Sometimes a code violation needs to be fixed in order for the city or the county to remove it and um, from the title to be able to close with a clean title. Now, examples of code violations can be, for example, that the grass is too tall. So it violated the city code. So in this case, the seller will have to hire someone to mow the grass, contact the city, and get that violation 
resolved. Obviously, we are going to facilitate all that and we're going to get a confirmation from the city that the violation has been removed, informed title, and, you know, continue. Now, sometimes it's not as easy as a overgrown grass. Sometimes it's like a, an expired or open permit, right? Let's say that the seller uh, replaced the roof three years ago. And now it shows on the uh, county that the uh, roofing company never closed out the permit. So now what we need to do is we need to contact that uh, company, roofing company, that completed the work three years ago and ask them to close the permit. And once the permit is closed, we can continue. Keep in mind that in some cases, the buyer might decide to close with the violations, the open permits, the liens, things like that. In that case, if that is what the parties agree, then the buyer will have to sign a hold harmless, which is a document basically saying that they're not going to hold the title company responsible for that. Okay, so in those cases, they can still close even though the title is not clean, but the buyer agree on that. And one more thing that in some cases, if the property is on an HOA community, on homeowners uh, association community, then you will have to get an estoppel letter. That is something that the title company um, order. And on the estoppel letter, you're going to see how much are the fees, if they need um, an approval process for the new owner or for a renter in the case that the owner is planning to rent out that property. And um, also if there is any type of violations or any type of uh, fees that are behind. The next one will be the loan approval. So if the buyer is using financing, then the buyer will have to achieve the loan approval in order to be able to receive the funds and close. So loan approval is huge <laughs> because if there is no approval, we have no money. So loan approval, again, as I said, is huge. And then after that, once that the loan is approved, the lender is going to send to the title company all the documentation that is required for the buyer to sign. The title company is also going to create some documentation on top of that for the buyer to sign. So at closing, the buyer is going to sign a huge pile of papers. You as a DC, as a transaction coordinator, are the main point of contact for all the parties. So the parties are the buyer and the seller, the real estate agent, both the listing agent and the, and the uh, buyer's agent, title company, lender, home inspector, appraiser, and land surveyor. You're going to keep everyone informed. You're going to um, assist with um, access to the property. And sometimes you are going to deal with all of them. Sometimes you're not going to deal with appraisers. Sometimes it's a cash transaction, so there is no appraisal needed, for example. And if it's a cash transaction, you're also not going to be um, dealing with the lender. Sometimes um, the buyer decide if it's a cash transaction that they don't want to pay for a survey. So they just close without a survey. And sometimes instead of a title company, you're going to be dealing with an attorney that is going to uh, perform the closing. And sometimes you're going to be dealing with a title company and with an attorney, let's say in the case that you have a probate process. And also, you might be dealing with other parties that are not even listed in here. For example, let's say that the uh, buyer is planning to complete a renovation right after closing. So maybe they need access to the property to take measurements, to get quotes from general contractors and things like that. So, you know, you are the main point of contact. And that means that you are going to be uh, dealing with all the parties, making sure that everyone is updated and you are going to alleviate the um, sellers or buyers agent on all this type of task. It's your duty <laughs> to kind of be a shield and, um, you know, take all these phone calls, all these emails, that way the real estate agent can do what they do best, which is sell properties and get more clients, more buyers or sellers. So that is for the main point of contact. And something that is super, super important as well is reminders. 
Why? Because if we don't take care of the due dates, then we can end up out of contract, okay, or in a breach of contract. Now, for the escrow, I normally send only one reminder because normally it's a very uh, short period of time. Normally it's like about three days that the buyer have to complete the escrow. If I uh, assist the buyer's agent, I'm going to be contacting the buyer and making sure that they are aware of when is the due date and explaining how it works, that they're going to receive uh, wear instructions directly from the title company and that they have you know, X amount of days to complete it and things like that. I'm going to make sure that they are aware because again, it's a very short period of time that they have to do a wire or drop off a check on the title company. And in some cases you're dealing with people that never done a wire before. So on top of everything, sometimes you are dealing with people that are super busy. So you need to always be a step ahead and make sure that you are proactive not reactive. You need to be proactive and help people to understand the process. The mindset should be that you deal with that every single day. You are a pro, you understand real estate, you are super familiar with that. However, the buyer, the seller might be the only time in their life that their buyer sell a house. So be mindful on that and, you know, again, be proactive. Another super important due date is the inspection contingency. Why? Because during the inspection period, the buyer could potentially cancel the contract. And for the most part, for the most part, their escrow is protected if they decide to cancel the contract during that period. However, let's say that they passed the inspection because you didn't count the days correctly or, you know, they thought that the seller will agree and sign, you know, a document giving them a credit or doing repairs, but the seller didn't sign it on time before the um, due date. And now it's the day after and they decide they're not going to sign. And now the buyer is like, oh, and then I'm going to cancel. And they're like, oh yeah, but you are risking your escrow. So you have a lot of responsibility in your hands along with the real estate agent. All right. So it's super important that, first of all, you calculate all the due dates correctly. And second, that you somehow have a system in place where you can send reminders to the parties and that you get reminders yourself. This is why I definitely recommend to use the task management software. Okay. Another due date that is super important is the appraisal, the appraisal contingency, along with the loan approval and the title commitment as well. So again, I send reminders and, you know, I keep an eye on, on things because it's not just a matter of sending reminders and, oh, well, I send a reminder. No, you need to be understanding what is going on. And if you send a reminder and you didn't get an answer, or if you just send a reminder, but you are like, oh my gosh, it's like 12 PM on the day that, you know, we have the escrow due and title company hasn't received it. Buyer is not answering. I mean, you need to be on top of things. Don't leave everything for last minute. So that is for the reminders. Now let's talk a little bit about compliance. Just to be super clear, I want to mention that the real estate agents must work under the supervision of a broker, meaning that the broker have to approve everything they do meaning documentation, right? Marketing and so on, but we're dealing with documentation. So in order for the broker to approve the file, you as the TC will have to upload all the documents to the broker compliance system. Sometimes they use dot loop, sometimes they use command, sometimes they use a sky slope, Whatever the system they use, you upload the documents. Obviously, prior to reviewing them and making sure that you check for accuracy, you check for signatures and making sure that everything is perfect. So you upload that for compliance and the broker is going to review and hopefully approve. 
If it's not approved, normally they're going to send the agent or yourself um, a message of some type, could be through the software or could be an email, and let you know what is missing or what needs to be changed in order to get approval. So why is it so important to get approval? Two reasons. First reason is because, you know, there is a lot of liability, you know, in real estate if you don't do the right thing. It's a lot of laws and regulations and you need to be compliant if you would like to keep your license, okay? I'm talking about the agent. And the other reason is because if the broker does not approve the file, then they do not issue a DA. A DA is a disbursement authorization. A disbursement authorization is going to be the document that the broker uh, gives to the title company, authorizing them to pay the real estate agent their commission. Why? Because technically, the commission belongs to the broker, not the real estate agent. Therefore, in order for the real estate agent to get paid, they have to have authorization from the broker. And if the file is not approved, the broker is not going to pay the commission for the most part. So it's super important because everyone wants to be paid at the closing table, right? Now, post-closing. Once that we get um, officially closed and funded, then a couple of things need to happen. You will have to get a copy of the um, final executed ALTA or HAD because most brokers request that to be uploaded in their system to close the file. Not to approve it, but to kind of give it the final, final approval it and close it. Some brokerages also request a copy of the commission checks. So you need to gather that from the title company. You will have to coordinate the keys because for the most part, the key exchange doesn't happen until the property is actually officially closed and funded. You might help the real estate agent uh, removing the sign and um, maybe sending a runner to remove the lockbox. Um, another example of post-closing might be helping the sellers uh, disconnecting uh, utilities or sending a request for a review to a client. So the post-closing are case by case and based on your own um, services, whatever you offer to your realtors uh, clients. Okay. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, the overview on the tasks that the transaction coordinators have to complete from uh, contract to closing and beyond. I will, um, in future videos, go deeper into each um, task. And if you find this information helpful, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And I will go ahead and see you on the next one. Thank you.